Hey everyone, this is Josh. Uh, in this video, we will be talking about reaction synthesis. Uh, these are a couple problems that were submitted to us. Um, so we're going to be talking about synthesis, synthesis problems specific to organic chemistry one. Uh, so scroll down here. Uh, in the problem on the top, you are given a starting reactant of simply cyclopentane and a series of reagents that um, you're asked to add and the goal there is to determine what the product will be after you add the series of reagents. Uh, the problem on the bottom, uh, the product is shown in blue on the left and the reactant is shown in black on the right uh, and the goal there is to decide what reagents you need to add to get from uh, the reactant to the product. So go ahead and pause the video at this point and give each problem uh, an attempt um, and then we can discuss them. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll over. Um, I have my work already drawn, drawn out, so the video is not too long. And so let's start with the one on the top. Uh, the first thing um, that we're asked to do is add uh, molecular bromine uh, in the presence of, of heat or light. And um, so let's walk through the, uh, the sequence of steps that occur in that particular reaction. Uh, the first thing that will occur is the bromine will split homolytically in the presence of heat. Um, so we see that the bromine simply splits. One electron goes to one bromine, the other electron goes to the other bromine. Um, and so now over here we have uh, a bromine um, with a, uh, an unpaired electron. Uh, that bromine will use his electron to form a bond with this hydrogen that was bonded um, on the cyclopentane. And, and the other electron in that bond will jump on to the cyclopentane. Usually in the reaction of, uh, this is called free radical halogenation, um, usually we'll, we will see a hydrogen be pulled off from the most stable position, uh, leaving this free radical electron right here uh, in the most stable position. But in this case, all the hydrogens are equivalent, uh, are equivalent um, so it didn't really matter which hydrogen uh, we chose. Um, so now we have this free radical electron. Uh, we have another molecular bromine uh, that's just in solution. And that bromine will also homolytically cleave where one electron will go to this one. And this electron will form a bond with that lone electron on the cyclopentane. Uh, and that will give us this bond right here. Uh, so now we have a bromocyclopentane. Uh, we've finished our free radical halogenation. Um, and then you're asked to add uh, sodium methoxide with ethanol as the solvent. Um, so here's our sodium methoxide right here with a negatively charged oxygen. It is a strong enough base, it is a very strong base. Uh, it is capable of stripping this hydrogen. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a beta hydrogen. We have to make sure that we're stripping a hydrogen off of one of the adjacent carbons to this carbon where the bromine is. Uh, so he'll strip a beta hydrogen and the electrons that were between this carbon and this hydrogen will drop down to form a double bond right there on the cyclopentane, forcing this bromine to leave as a leaving group, uh, taking his electrons with him. And so we come down here and we see that our bromine is left and we now have an alkene. Um, a strong base acting on a secondary bromine or a secondary chlorine uh, for the majority of the time will go E2, uh, resulting in an alkene. Uh, there will be a slight amount of substitution product where um, this ethoxide up here may go and substitute uh, the bromine straight out, uh, giving us an ether as a product. Um, but the majority of the time, it'll do what we just did, uh, resulting in an alkene through uh, E2 chemistry. Okay, so, so now we're down here at this alkene. Uh, the final step is a sequential addition of ozone uh, next with water and zinc. And this is ozonolysis. Uh, what ozonolysis accomplishes is it will split our alkene uh, on whatever compound we're discussing. And in this case, it's our cyclopentene. Uh, and on either end of where the double bond was, so on this carbon on, and on this carbon, um, it will add a ketone or an aldehyde, uh, depending on what kind of structure we're talking about. But in this case, we get two aldehydes on the end of our 
of our uh, compound and that is our ultimate product right there. Um, so we walked through free, free radical halogenation using molecular bromine. Um, we walked through dehydrohalogenation using a strong base and we saw some E2 chemistry and then we used ozone analysis uh, to give us that resulting product shown in blue. Um, so let's jump down to this next one. Um, so again we start with the uh, the molecule in black. Um, so before I start walking through everything here because it's kind of a lot, um, this particular reaction is somewhat of a stretch. Um, it, it definitely is a stretch. Uh, if we were to use all these different sequences um, like this, uh, very low chances of getting the product we want and if we do at very low yield. But regardless, this is a good example problem because it walks us through several mechanisms um, that we've learned uh, and some particular properties of those mechanisms. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, the first thing we're doing is we're adding molecular bromine again in the presence of heat. Uh, I won't walk through the mechanism again. The only thing I, I want to point out is the fact that we stripped a hydrogen, that one right there, we stripped a hydrogen from the most stable position. In this case, it's a tertiary carbon that I just circled in red. Uh, we stripped that hydrogen. Um, free radical halogenation, um, our free radical bromine or our free radical chlorine, uh, the majority of the time, especially with bromine, the majority of the time will strip a hydrogen uh, from the most stable position. And we will see some uh, secondary product um, there as well and some primary product as well. Um, so th again, that leaves us with our uh, free radical electron right there in the tertiary position, the most stable position with a, uh, a lot of electron uh, density uh, comparatively. And then our molecular bromine will split, another molecular bromine will split um, forming a bond with the lone electron that's on our carbon chain and resulting in another free radical bromine in that same step. Uh, but th that gives us this as our product. Um, again, that's, that's the, uh, those are the steps of free radical halogenation. Uh, we added a bromine to our carbon chain. Uh, and similar to the previous problem, we're also going to add sodium methoxide uh, with ethanol again. Um, and another thing that I want to point out is um, here's our alpha carbon where our bromine is attached to. And we have a beta carbon here and a beta carbon there, right? Um, so the, the trend that we see when we add a strong base, it, like I mentioned in the previous problem, is that our strong base will strip a hydrogen uh, that uh, following what we call Zaitsev's rule and that will result in a double bond, an alkene um, that is more stable than if you were to strip the hydrogens off of the other beta position. So in this case we're pulling off this hydrogen, okay, the base is coming in and pulling off that hydrogen, uh, its electrons are dropping down to form a double bond right there forcing the bromine to leave with his electrons as a leaving group. And so here we have uh, our, our alkene, our double bond now. Um, and I just want to point out that our other option in this case was to form a double bond there. But that double bond would have been between a tertiary carbon and a primary carbon instead of a tertiary carbon and a secondary carbon. So this double bond that we formed ultimately uh, will be in the majority of our products um, from that step uh, because it is the more stable alkene. From there, I'm going to add, add a hydrobromic acid in the presence of peroxides. Uh, this is free radical addition in the presence of peroxides. Um, and so our peroxides will split in the presence of light. So now we have a free radical um, oxygen on the, end of the, on the end of our peroxide. And it will use its lone electron to, to strip the hydrogen off of our hydrobromic acid, uh, resulting in a free radical bromine that we see down here. Uh, that free radical bromine is capable of reacting with the electrons within our double bond, uh, those pi electrons. So this double bond will split, forming a bond with one of its electrons with the lone electron on bromine, and the other electron will jump down to the more stable position. Just like we talked about with free radical halogenation, um, that lone electron will go the majority of the time to that more stable position, and in this case, it is a tertiary position. Okay, so this lone electron that we see over here is in a tertiary position and the bromine got added to the secondary position. 
Um, and that's the usefulness of free radical addition in the presence of peroxides, is it puts our bromine in the less stable position instead of the tertiary position like we saw back uh, in normal free radical halogenation with molecular bromine and molecular chlorine. Um, so we have, that free we have that free radical there now. Um, it will react with another hydrobromic acid, this time forming a bond uh, with the hydrogen, resulting in another free radical bromine that we don't really care about. Um, but now we have a hydrogen in that tertiary position right there. There's now a hydrogen there. Okay. Um, next, we're going to add another strong base, but this time, instead of adding ethoxide or methoxide or hydroxide, uh, we're going to add terbutoxide. And what terbutoxide accomplishes for us, uh, terbutoxide is what we call a strong base and a weak nucleophile, okay? Uh, and what he's able to do, because he's so bulky, because he has these bulky carbon, uh, these bulky methyl groups on top, um, on top of him, on top of the oxygen, is this base can either access uh, these beta, this one beta hydrogen over here, or it can access these beta hydrogens over here. Um, Terbutoxide will follow uh, anti to Zaitsev's rule, which means the double bond that we'll see resulting the majority of the time won't be in the more stable position. It'll actually form in uh, what we've determined the, the less stable position. Um, so terbutoxide will do anti zaitsev it'll pull uh, this hydrogen off, and those electrons will drop down there to form the double bond, and bromine will leave uh, as a leaving group with its electrons. So just remember, uh, terbutoxide and any other strong base weak nucleophiles that you've been taught uh, will follow anti zaitsevs rule. Um, and in this case, that's useful because that puts our double bond in a different position, and if we were to use ethoxide or methoxide, we would just go back to... Um, what we had over here that I just pointed to just we were just gone back to where we were and um, That wouldn't have been useful So anyway uh, from there we have this product from that step and um, Don't be tempted to try and add um, You know do an electrophilic addition with HCl here um, Because that will put our chlorine back where our bromine was here and we'll just be back to where we were again, uh, and that's not going to accomplish anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do hydroboronation, um, which will result in an alcohol, but it will put the alcohol on the end of our carbon chain instead of that secondary position uh, that we saw that we see our bromine at previously. So in hydroboronation, uh, here, we, here we have a boron attached to three hydrogens. Uh, these electrons between this, the boron and the hydrogen will go there to this carbon, uh, and the electrons of the double bond are going to reach out for the boron to form a bond with that boron. So we're over here now. We see that we have a boron attached to uh, two hydrogens now, because the other hydrogen was bonded there. Um, we have this base down here. Uh, we have a, a strong base with, the, with a negatively charged oxygen, and um, it'll come in and attack the boron which is positively charged enough to, to let that occur, um, resulting in this intermediate down here. Uh, hydroboronation, um, I would say, is one of the more odd uh, arrow pushing mechanisms that uh, I remember learning in organic chemistry one. Uh, this step right here, we have these electrons between the carbon and the boron coming out and reaching for the oxygen, and then the hydroxide group on the very end there uh, leaves. I know that my professor specifically wasn't able to explain you know, exactly why that happens uh, other than that we know what our ultimate product is and that this arrow pushing mechanism is one of the best um, things that you know, scientists have been able to deduce. Um, so from that step we get this as our intermediate. Um, from there the hydroxide group that left, it w I mean it won't be the exact same one, but a hydroxide group in solution will come and pull uh, the boron with its two hydrogens off of our uh, compound and this oxygen will take uh, his electrons back from that. So now we have a negatively charged oxygen over here that will pull a hydrogen off of something in solution. In this case I've drawn a water and uh, so pull hydrogen off um, those electrons will go jump back on there onto that oxygen and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the resulting compound from hydroboronation is a um, alcohol 
in uh, the primary position instead of the secondary position. We know how to add an alcohol to an alkene um, that will ultimately leave the alcohol in the more stable position, um, you know, using water, sulfuric acid, and things like that. Um, but the thing that hydroboronation accomplishes is, is, is that it put this alcohol right here on the primary position of our carbon chain. Um, and we'll see why that's useful because now we're going to add the chlorine that we want to add. Um, don't be tempted to add HCl here. I know that um, adding HCl and, and, H, and, and hydrobromic acid, uh, alkyl halide formation is one of the first mechanisms that we learned in organic chemistry one. Um, but we have to remember that hydrochloric acid will not react with a primary alcohol. Instead, you need to add SOCl2 with pyridine, and, uh, which is what I've shown here. And we're going to go ahead and walk through that arrow pushing mechanism, mechanism now. So the first thing is that oxygen reaches out for the sulfur, the most positively charged atom within SOCl2, um, forming a bond with the sulfur. And these electrons will jump up onto the oxygen, uh, giving us this intermediate over here. Um, we have a positively charged oxygen there now. Uh, don't forget your positive and negative charges. I know I haven't talked about those too much throughout this, uh, this video. Um, so pyridine will come and strip the hydrogen off of that oxygen. The oxygen will take its electrons back uh, to become a neutral atom now. Um, there we have this intermediate. This oxygen will drop its electrons down uh, to form that double bond that once was there, forcing one of the chlorines to leave. Okay. Um, we have, so we have free-floating chlorine in solution now, negatively charged. It'll come and backside attack that carbon there, forcing this SOCl2 group uh, to leave, um, and this chlorine leaves in the process. Um, and so because that chlorine came and backside attacked, it takes the position of, that, of what we've created as a good leaving group. This right here is a good leaving group now because of all the chemistry that happened uh, previously. Uh, allowing that chlorine to come in and backside attack and ultimately take that position. And we get our product in blue. Um, again, this mechanism was long, uh, a lot of steps, a lot of different things we added, um, but it's beneficial because it walks through different mechanisms and the properties of different ones, you know, what rules occur and where things add and things of that nature. So thank you for submitting this video and hopefully uh, that helped.